Dr. Holly Rizzo here. Welcome back to our series in pediatric dentistry. Today we'll be discussing different types of dental anomalies and our goal for today is to understand the differences between each one of them. So our lecture will be divided into two parts. In this part, we'll discuss anomalies of number, size, and shape, and next time we'll discuss anomalies of structure. So to begin, we'll discuss anomalies of number, and this can be divided into two types. The first type is supernumerary teeth, which means having more teeth than normal, and congenitally missing teeth, which is when you have fewer teeth than you're supposed to. So supernumerary teeth, as we said, is when you have more teeth in the mouth present than normal. They're kind of like the dental equivalent of unexpected guests at a dinner party. They're not on the guest list, but they somehow show up anyway. So we can see in this picture that there's an additional tooth between the canine and the first premolar here. So the etiology of this is unknown and it's usually unexpected, but we do know that it affects males more than females with a ratio of two to one, and the most common site is the anterior maxilla. A common subtype of supernumerary tooth is the mesiodens, which refers to an extra tooth that is located between the maxillary central incisors. On the other hand, congenitally missing teeth is when we have fewer teeth in the mouth than we normally should. This can be divided into three types, including hypodontia, oligodontia, and anodontia. So starting with hypodontia, this is when we have one to six teeth missing. Oligodontia is when there is more than six missing teeth. And finally, anodontia is the absence of all teeth. This is rare and a very severe condition that requires special dental attention. In the primary dentition, the maxillary lateral incisor is the most common tooth be to be congenitally missing. In this photo, notice the upper left central incisor here. We can see that there's no evidence for eruption and there's also no evidence in the radiograph for this tooth. In permanent teeth, the most commonly congenitally missing teeth in this order from most common to least common is the third molar, the mandibular second premolar, the maxillary lateral incisor, and the maxillary second premolar or bicuspid. This is very important to know as this is high yield information for the exam. So congenitally missing teeth can sometimes occur without any associated medical condition, but others are indicative of an underlying genetic or developmental abnormality, such as Down syndrome, cleft lip and or palate, or ectodermal dysplasia. So moving on to anomalies of size, this category encompasses variations in tooth size that can deviate from the norm. This includes microdontia, macrodontia, fusion, and gemination. So microdontia, as the name implies, refers to abnormally small teeth, where the size of one or more teeth is smaller than normal. Microdontia can manifest in many different ways, and there's three types. It can be true generalized to start, which is when all teeth in the dentition are smaller than normal. Next, there's relative generalized. Here, the teeth are small in relation to the larger jaw size. It's like having teeth that seem disproportionately small compared to the jaw that they're housed in. And finally, we have localized microdontia. In this case, there is only one tooth that is smaller than the rest of the dentition. This picture represents a case of localized microdontia that affects the maxillary lateral incisor. This tooth is most commonly affected with this anomaly and is called the peg lateral due to its smaller size compared to the adjacent teeth. The prevalence of microdontia is greater in the maxilla compared to the mandible. Remember in this lecture, we mentioned two conditions that are more common in the maxilla. Supernumerary teeth are more common in the anterior maxilla, and now microdontia tends to occur more frequently in the maxilla as well. So next, let's move on to macrodontia. Essentially, macrodontia refers to big teeth where one or more of the teeth are larger than normal. Notice the size here of the upper centrals compared to the rest of the teeth. Similar to microdontia, macrodontia also presents in three types. The first type is true generalized macrodontia, where all of the teeth in the entire dentition are larger than normal. Next, there's relative generalized macrodontia, where the teeth are large in relation to the size of the jaw. And lastly, we have localized macrodontia. This is where only one single tooth is larger than the rest of the dentition. So the prevalence of macrodontia is 0.03% to 9%, and this is more common in males than females. Next, let's discuss fusion. This is where two or more normally distinct tooth buds unite during development. It can occur between adjacent crowns, roots, or both, resulting in the formation of a single larger tooth structure. This union typically happens during the cap stage of tooth development when the tooth buds are forming. 
It's important to remember that even though fusion results in the merging of tooth structures, teeth may still have separate root canals. Look at the picture here. You can see how the central and lateral incisors are fused together. They look like one big tooth, but in fact, they're not. Fusion is frequently observed in primary teeth and in the anterior regions. One helpful diagnostic clue to identify fusion is that when teeth fuse together, it may appear as if one tooth is missing, especially when the fused teeth are counted as a single entity. This discrepancy in tooth count can aid in identifying cases of fusion during dental exams. Gemination is when a single tooth bud attempts to divide during development, resulting in a bifid or twinned crown. Gemination typically occurs during the bud or cap stage of tooth development. And during this process, instead of forming two separate teeth, the single tooth bud tries to divide but remains partially joined, leading to a twinned appearance in the crown. One characteristic feature of gemination is the presence of a shared root canal system, compared to fusion where there's two separate canals. Notice in the radiograph how we have one single canal extending from the root, which then bifurcates into the crown to form two different canal systems. Gemination is more commonly seen in primary teeth and unilaterally, affecting only one side of the dental arch. One diagnostic feature of gemination is that when the geminated tooth is counted as one, there are no teeth missing. This can be helpful in distinguishing gemination from other dental anomalies where a tooth may be absent. So in discussing fusion versus gemination, on the left we have fusion, which starts with two distinct tooth buds. These tooth buds fuse together to form two teeth that have their dentin glued together, and form a two separate root canal systems. While in gemination, there's one tooth that bifurcates and divides at the crown with a single root canal system present. Remember in fusion, there's one tooth missing and in gemination, the tooth count is normal. So next let's move on to other types of dental anomalies of shape. So we'll discuss here dens evaginatus, dens invaginatus, tarodontism, and dilaceration. So dens evaginatus can be defined as the presence of an extra cusp on a tooth. This cusp can not only involve enamel, but also dentin and pulp, making it a comprehensive anomaly. Interestingly, dens evaginatus tends to be unilateral, only affecting one side of the dental arch. The mandibular premolar is the most likely permanent tooth to be affected by dens evaginatus, but in anterior teeth, this anomaly is known as a talon cusp. So dens evaginatus has a prevalence ranging from 0.06% to 7.7% and is more frequently observed in individuals of Asian descent and Native American populations. Dens invaginatus is also known as dens indente, and this is a developmental anomaly that occurs during tooth formation. It arises when the inner enamel epithelium, which plays a crucial role in tooth development, folds or invaginates inward into the dental papilla before calcification occurs. Take a look at the clinical photo of the right lateral incisor. Notice how the enamel folds in on itself, creating an atypical presentation here. So this invagination can vary in depth, and in severe cases, it may extend into the pulp. So here's a radiograph depicting dens invaginatus. So again, we can see that it is an infolding of enamel and dentin. So again, take a look at the radiograph on the right. This mixed radiolucency shows that in the lateral incisor, we can see the depth and complexity of the invagination, and it almost looks as if there's a tooth within the lateral incisor. Moreover, the maxillary lateral incisor is the tooth most likely to be infected by dens invaginatus. Another characteristic of dens invaginatus is that it's typically bilateral, unlike dens evaginatus, meaning that it may affect both sides of the dental arch. Remember earlier when we discussed microdontia? We mentioned that the maxillary lateral incisor is the most commonly affected tooth. Well, interestingly, the same holds true for dens invaginatus. Tarodontism is derived from the Latin word taros for bull and the Greek term otis for tooth, or as we can say, bull tooth. Take a look at this image and see how the pulp chamber is very, very large here, and the tooth somehow looks like a bull. We can see how the root bifurcation is placed away apically compared to the molar next to it. So tarodontism is characterized by an enlarged pulp and apical displacement of the pulpal floor near the root apex. Affected teeth often exhibit short roots and canals with a lack of constriction at the CEJ. So diagnosing tarodontism typically requires a preoperative radiograph for accurate assessment. Tarodontism is typically an isolated anomaly, meaning that it occurs independently. And there are three types of tarodontism where we can discuss. 
So we have an hypotardon where the pulp chamber is slightly enlarged and there's a mild apical displacement of the pulpal floor near the root apex. However, these changes are not as pronounced in other types of tarodontism. Next, we have mesotarodontism, which represents an intermediate stage between hypotarodontism and hypertarodontism. And finally, we have hypertarodontism, which is characterized by a significantly enlarged pulp chamber and a pronounced apical displacement of the pulpal floor toward the root apex. The, most, the tooth most likely to be affected by tyrodontism is the mandibular molar. The final dental anomaly we'll discuss today is dilaceration. Dilaceration is an abnormal bend or curvature in the root of a tooth. This bend typically occurs in the apical half of the root. So one common cause of dilaceration is trauma, particularly in cases involving primary anterior teeth. Traumatic injuries such as intrusion, lateral luxation, or extrusion of primary teeth can affect the development of the underlying permanent tooth. The permanent maxillary premolar area is most likely to be affected by dilaceration. So diagnosing dilaceration typically requires preoperative radiographs for accurate assessment of the root structure. Dilaceration can pose significant challenges, especially to root canal treatment. The degree of bend can definitely cause issues in root canal treatment, making it very challenging. The bend typically occurs in the apical one half of the root. So next, let's discuss some questions to review our knowledge today. So example one says each of the following is an anomaly of tooth shape except one, and which is the exception. So we have option A, dens and dente, B, tarodontism, C, dilaceration, D, anodontia, or E, dens evaginatus. So take a moment to pause and think about this question. So the correct answer to this question is anodontia. Dental anomalies of shape include dens evaginatus, dens invaginatus, tarodontism, and dilaceration. Anodontia is the absence of all teeth, which is an anomaly of number. So let's move on to our next and final question. So this question asks, which is the most likely dental condition found in this patient? This is a 20-year-old male whose chief complaint is that his teeth feel weak, sensitive, and they have very weird yellow stains. The background for this patient is that they have fair oral hygiene, they're a non-smoker, and they have several existing restorations. And we can see the full dentition clinically. So back to the question, which is the most likely dental condition? We have option A, amelogenesis imperfecta, option B, dentinogenesis imperfecta, C, regional odontodysplasia, and D, tarodontism. So again, take a moment to pause to think about this question. So the correct answer here would be option A, amelogenesis imperfecta. The x-ray shows a thin layer of enamel in the permanent dentition with normal dentin and pulp development. These are characteristics of amelogenesis imperfecta. So let's summarize our discussion today. So today we discussed that dental anomalies of number include supernumerary teeth and congenitally missing teeth. We also discussed that dental anomalies of size include microdontia, macrodontia, fusion, and gemination. And finally, we discussed that dental anomalies of shape include dens evaginatus, dens invaginatus, torodontism, and dilaceration. Thank you so much for watching and join us in part two where we will discuss anomalies of structure. See you next time.